Welcome to a show about things you can see without going far, and a lot of them are free. If you thought there was nothing in the old heartland, you ought to hit the black op with these fools in a van. Look out, they're driving hard, checking out art in their own backyard. Randy does the steering so he won't hurl. Mike's got the map, such a man of the world. That's done with the camera, kind of heavy on his shoulder. And that giant ball of tape, it's a world record holder. Look out, they're driving hard, checking out art in their own backyard. Look out, they're driving hard, checking out the world in their own backyard. Checking out the world in their own backyard. Dear TV Mailbag, Go. what's wrong with this picture? Hi, Don the Camera Guy here, but not behind the camera and not quite ready for my close-up either. There, that's better. Though to borrow a phrase, we're not quite out of the forest yet. The Forest Motel, that is, which seems somewhat Spartan, even for TV weasels like these. I always like rooms with those little iron marks on the carpet. The iron mark on the carpet says someone was here. Yes, kind of like motel crop circle. Yeah. yeah. I guess lodging options are limited here in the North Jersey woods. At least, the forest is conveniently located just a few farm fields and babbling brooks away from our first stop of the day, Luna Park. That's park with a C like it's spelled in Italy. Now Ricky Boscarino, sometimes known as King Ricky, did attend art school, a prestigious one whose initials rhyme with Frisbee. But what he learned there has little to do with what he's doing here. I think the second day I was here, I actually painted the house uh, yellow, purple, and green. And then a couple new windows, some of the, the frou-frou on the, the edges. And then that's how it started. And then, you know, 15 years later, this is, this is what happened. <laughs> so, <laughs> I try not to take things apart. I just kind of try to add to them, just layering and layering. So that's the, that's the effect. I'm constantly searching and, and scavenging and dumpster diving, always. So that's really part of it, is, is the collecting of it. The, the trick is try to keep it looking good before it gets used, or else it starts looking like a junkyard. Are there different segments that we have names for here? Well, this is the illuminated garden. And it, it lights up quite nice, I hear. Yes, it's um, a pretty spectacular sight at night. You know, it's incredibly quiet during the days, and uh, when I'm not traveling on the road, uh, I can spend days here just like doing projects and, you know, endless all day. Puttering. Puttering, yes. Yeah. I come from a long line of putterers. Bottles are a running theme here. Do you choose the bottles for the way they'll light up? Do you choose them for the color? Well, I am partial to the blue. This is actually, this is a fun project. These are what I call the bamboo forest. These are water bottles filled with cement and then the plastic stripped away. This is the uh, monument to my beloved cat, Brel, Jacques Brel. Yes, I won all of these trophies. <laughs> What's out for? Wood chopping. Well, this is when you were in your hockey days. Yes. <laughs> your hockey career. That was just recent. This is the Chapel of the Saints. This uh, is dedicated to my grandfather who witnessed a miracle when he was a young man in Sicily. He witnessed this young crippled boy being healed. Oh, here's the monument to my, uh, my little potbelly pig Webster. And where's Webster now? There. Oh, <laughs> no. Some forms that appeal to you in particular? You like the kind of... A good Animal swirl. A good swirl is uh, is pretty popular here. This was a five-year project. Uh, I went from one extreme to the other. All I had was the outhouse and a very third-world bathroom with really ugly plumbing. I think I tiled for three months straight, like literally every single day. Get up in the morning, tile all day, 
Towards the end of the project, I just wanted the thing done. Sometimes I don't understand, I don't know where it comes from, you know, just to be driven. Um, sometimes to the point where I, I don't sleep and I'm not eating, so I have to always kind of keep that in check also. This took a long time to lay out, because it looks random, but it's really not. It's about the coolest floor I've ever seen. It is cool, isn't it? It really yeah, is. It really is. I, I look at it and think, wow, this is really great. In my uh, next addition to the house, I'm going to have, I'm calling it the ballroom. It's going to be a, probably 20 by 30, and it'll be just like this. It'll be uh, this floor. Do you see things in that kind of a scale? I mean, that's a long ways out. Yeah, well, I plan to live to 100, and I plan to never leave here. So, you know, <laughs> got projects planned, at least for the next 20 years. I don't see any uh, separation between medium. You know, you just, it's just a manipulation of materials. When I make the, the molds for the cement, they come out very much like the pottery. And then sometimes the pottery gets topped on top of that. So you'll notice there are some ceramic pieces on top holding up the, uh, the, the globes. As of now, pottery is just, it's kind of just an expensive hobby. In my old age, that's what I'll be doing is, uh, I'll be doing pottery. But I plan to retire as a potter. You mean from putter to potter? <laughs> but wait, there's still more. A line of jewelry being made back here by Ricky and his pal Tuck. Moons and swirls that keep the funds coming to keep the lights at Luna Park humming. However, one thing they don't have here is the world's largest ball of videotape. It's heavy. Oh, wow, cool. <laughs> what do you think? Oh, it's not that heavy. Wow. I mean, it really looks kind of like Luna, doesn't it? It's cool. Can I have it? <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. Well, it would alleviate uh, some of the crowding in our Chrysler, but cooler heads did prevail, and we left Luna with our big orb still aboard. Next stop, New York. Haberstraw, to be exact, south of the Tappan Zee, where the Hudson River runs its widest. And where a Polish emigre named Ted Lu... Uh, Lu now, I could use some help here. Ludwichak. Ludwichak. Ludwichak has gone to the head of the class in his new career, which started shortly after his old one, making contact lenses, ended. You didn't cut your first stone until you were 59? Uh, no, about maybe 62. 62 you started, and you've done all this Don't ask me how old I am now. You know. Okay, and I'm not going to ask, <laughs> no. but how old are you? 77. 70, and you're yeah. still cutting the stone? Yeah, still cutting stone. It seems like uh, rocks like me, stone likes me. <laughs> wow. That's where it started. <laughs> this is the beginning. I, was, I wasn't used to be retired. Uh, <laughs> I am active man. <laughs> so I built that seawall to protect my property from the hurricanes. That wall seems like a kind of a naked or grayish. <laughs> so I gotta, gotta, gotta dress it up. Oh, this is the first one. This got knocked at the, uh, uh, the Andrew, the storm. There's plenty of rocks laying around. So I look, one, one was a kind of familiar. He looked at me, I look at him, you know. I, I think I saw a nose and eye. So I, I adopt another eye and, and mouth and lips. I went next day morning to take a look. I see how if he's still there, but he has a kind of a sad face. Uh, maybe I maybe I give him a company. So I I look another rock. I cut. So there were two of them. I went down the river. I see another rock that seems like it had a face in it. So I put a third one. And after that, I keep chiseling. I remember I was going to stop at uh, at 12, but then I missed the counting. It was 13, there was too many. So I <laughs> finally fill up the whole wall, the 60 feet of wall. So I put 42 heads. The little uh, weather beat me, you know. Some of them are wearing necklaces, it looks like. Uh, I, found the, I found the uh, shells here, so I, was, I figured I'd give them a little color, you know. Are any of them wearing contacts? <laughs> At the beginning, I use only chisels and hammer. And after uh, 10 years, mm, my friends, you know, the other artists say, why don't you use power tools? 
So now I use half and half. Didn't I read that you used some tools of your own making? Uh, yeah, I, oh, that's right. I, I found like a, a lawnmower blade, extremely good steel, very hard steel. So I don't have to sharpen all the time. What, do you use the same kinds of techniques that you did when you were no, making I contact lenses? Uh, uh, oh yeah, I had the feelings. I had that, 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 that touch, oh, touch and feeling. It's kind of about what the rock tells you, right? Yeah, uh, like somebody hiding there, you know, so you gotta peel it out, you know, get him out. But sometimes they tough, they don't wanna reveal their, you know, real, real shape, so I have, to, I have to help, I have to dig it in, and then come all right, you know, in the end. Yeah, there, there's a couple more heads here. Yeah, just a couple. I guess we understand each other a little bit, you know. When you put your, when you put your life into it or, or effort, then, then they come, they come like a family almost, you know. At first, Ted's heads all had names, but even he couldn't keep up with that. We said our fond farewells, took one last look at the view, then resumed our ride upriver, across it, and onto the kind of roads that have been known to separate Randy from his lunch. There's some irony here, and the irony is that we've chosen this route on account of food, a place in Patterson whose legend precedes it. Though perhaps the cuisine takes a backseat to its decor. See, that's, not, that's no ordinary parking lot now, so, is it? Somebody spilled a lot of paint. <laughs> yes, there is a rosemary. She's been doing this for 35 years, and yes, she does make quite a first impression. Are you from Texas? Yes, I am. I'm a Houstonian. Tostadas and a guacamole. Rosemary, is, is that your Texas hair color? Uh, this is uh, something that I've done in the last 10 years because I cannot stand gray. It's definitely a color not found in nature. Well, should we eat the food and shut up? Yes, y'all go right ahead because I've got to get back to work. Did I mention this place is a visual feast? Sorry, but here's one I just can't resist. There's a purple hair on my taco. <laughs> Quiet, they'll all want one. <laughs> Yeah, that's, you see that? like a little bit of clearing sky ahead. That's, that's good. It certainly is, since otherwise you're bound to see lots of this and this and worst of all, this. We've nothing to fear but lack of beer. Hey, come on, this is FDR's old stomping grounds after all, so we decided to stomp around them. But due to bad weather and construction, this is all we could see the highlight of which was the new dealer's dumpster. But that can only hold our attention so long. So we headed back out the gates and back to Hyde Park, when all of a sudden something neither Roosevelt nor Vanderbilt caught our collective eye. What is it? That? Yeah. Alien spaceship car. Alien spaceship car. Really? Did you see the aliens? He could tell us, but then he'd have to kill us, of course. Besides, we've got better things to do. Despite the drizzle, the boy seemed doggedly determined to play catch in nearby Rock City at the literal fork in the road. Now that's just plain dumb. But these two producers have proven time and again that dumb luck works nearly as well as being good. And luck seems to have found us once again a few miles south of Spencertown for our dry arrival at Roy Canwich Taconic Sculpture Park, where a giant head on the hillside lures passers-by from the parkway below. So this is Mother Earth. Um, She's actually the same size as the head of the Statue of Liberty. A lot of people think it's a male Indian. What is that, concrete? It's, yeah, it's um, cement over a steel framework. And uh, how much cement is there? 
I'm guessing three tons or so. I mean, you know, it's hollow. So would you like to come into my head? Come in. Why, well, thank you. I, actually, I was kind of curious about the guy with the, is that? That's the first big cement piece I did. Uh, it's Dionysus, Greek god of the vine. Well, see, uh, I'm looking at him and thinking, for a minute here, I'm standing here. It's not a self-portrait. Sure no, it's like. not. Yeah, yeah. All his bearded guys look alike, I know, but my head is not quite that big. Well, it's bigger. It's big. Yeah, it, but it, you, it, from it, your perspective, it is, it yes. Is, it is. Well, this has got a little contribution from the birds that we don't really appreciate, but this is the hardest piece of stone I ever met in my life. I feel like a Greek god. Well, you look like one. I you won't like say one. which one. Patheticus. Yeah, I've always loved the ancient world, Greeks, Egyptians, Romans, and you know, I think if you look around, you can see a bit of their inspiration. There's something you know distinctly Mediterranean about the female figure and um, the vegetation combined with it. They're sort of fertility goddesses. Uh, usually the, the plant shapes that I use are something growing in the field or something growing in the house. Her head over there was a, a house plant we had you know, inspired by a house plant we had. You know, I can do a normal body with a normal head, but you know, after you've done that for a while, you wanna do something different. What is that behind this? Well, it started out as a guest house, uh, and we were gonna build further up the hill um, for the main house, but then uh, it just sort of kept growing, and we decided this would be the house. The stone was free, it came off the land, those old stone walls, so. We like free materials, we'll take those anytime. And uh, I love stone, what can I say? It, it, uh, as soon as you put it up, it looks old. Now we've been here for 20 years, uh, and I was in Vermont for almost 20 years also, where I learned marble carving and various other rural arts. You know, being a city boy, I sort of learned how to survive out here in the country. Don't walk into my wife's lavender patch. Is your wife an integral part of, when you say us, is she, yes. how does she fit into this? Well, she has a regular job. Uh, <laughs> she's paying she's, the bills. <laughs> she pays a lot of them. <laughs> I do the flowers, and he does the grunt work. He does the digging of the trees, you know. <laughs> and he does the stacking of the rocks. The reason people like the place is because the sculptures fit in the landscape. And the flowers and the greenery just add to that. He's been in the Times, he's been in the Globe, and people come to see it. And we're always worried, like, oh no. <laughs> They've driven a long ways to see this. Are they gonna be disappointed? But no. <laughs> Man, that flying nun thing was cool. I'm thinking Titanic. I'm thinking you're the king of the head. I think I've always had in mind doing a lot of sculptures that would fit in uh, with a bigger landscape. Of course, that clashes with the idea of selling them. Oh, there's some heat. See, it always comes back to balls, either throwing them or showing them off. <laughs> now, it's heavy. Oh, of course it is. It's the world's largest. What were you thinking? Clearly, we weren't. But that's never stopped us before, and it's not stopping us now. As we bid adieu to this nice taconic duo and nudge north ever so slightly towards the pastorally placed Berkshire Farm Center, where a Yankee fan named Ray Matterson awaits us. Ray works out here with troubled youth, but his real claim to fame is socks and the tiny intricate art he makes from them. A skill he honed doing hard time for drug-related crimes prior to being paroled in 1995. Certainly when I first started, I had no idea where it was going to go. But I knew that after I completed the first piece which I did, which was a University of Michigan emblem, and all of my fellow inmates started coming up to me and saying, you know, yo man, where'd you get that? Yo, make me something, you know? And offering to pay me in cartons of cigarettes and bags of coffee. I said, yeah, sure, I'll do that. Um, but was I taught, no, everything was pretty much trial and error. And when I first began this, you know, my fingers were, um, were, were quite bloodied. And, you know, I had some serious calluses on the tips of my fingers after a while. Uh, but I've gotten much better with the sewing needle over the years. This is um, called Covenant and Betrayal. It's, it's Christ with the apostles. I sketched the idea and then I transfer it onto the cloth, you know, as best I can, and then essentially paint with needle and thread. 
Raw materials, gentlemen. Jeez. You have the fuzzy thread, which is the cotton, and it breaks and frays quite easily. But that's supported and gets, gets the elastic with this uh, nylon thread. It's strong, it's got a nice sheen to it, and that's what I actually use. Uh, and the sewing hoop that I use is a converted Rubbermaid dish. There weren't many craft and art supplies in the state prison. We're talking a scale here so infinitesimal, it's, it's mind-boggling. I was asked once, how many stitches are there per the square inch? So not having a whole lot to do while I was incarcerated, I actually measured out a square quarter of an inch and counted every stitch in the square quarter of an inch and then multiplied it out. And it works out to about 1,200 stitches to the square inch. Do you do many that have the actual prison motif? I think I did maybe one prison piece while I was, two prison pieces while I was incarcerated. For me, this was, this was an escape from, from the, the reality that I was in. So I would do pieces that depicted dreams that I had of uh, being on a beach with a loved one. So I would escape into there and I, you know, and working very close, because I'm, you know, I'm probably, you know, eight inches away from this when I'm, when I'm working on it. So I'm, I'm right there. People are, are constantly amazed. They say, I didn't realize socks came in that many different colors. And they do. I mean, at last count, and it's been, you know, a few years now, but I, I counted the number of colors on my sock palette, so to speak, and I have 120 or so, or more, actually, shades and colors that they are all from sock thread. Ray is now an author as well. He co-wrote this book with his wife, Melanie, and uses his own life story as proof that art's a way to help kids cope. The center's grounds are a lovely place for pausing and reflecting, but naturally there's no time for that. Someone's decided we have to make Lake George by dark, though being passed by a Dodge Dart is never a good sign. And neither, I suspect, is this. Where is everybody? It's a theme park that's closed. I thought we just that got a really great parking place. Yeah. <laughs> Look, where is everybody? No, the diving horse has gone home for the day, and though there may be plenty of muffler men inside, this is all I can see out here. Paul Bunyan, whoa, chopping some wood. Well, you know, bunions are big up here. We're there, though. Not a muffler man, but one giant being. Aren't you glad I found this, Don? No. <laughs> How far do we drive to see this? How far out of our way do we go to see this? And who do I got to call to get off this damn show? Oh. I'm calling my agent. I'm going to get off this show. <laughs> Let's go. Hop in, Don. That reminds me. That reminds me. We need to go. I don't think anything's open in Vermont on Sunday morning in the rain. Everybody's at church. Yeah. Now, if this were football, they'd be giving us the two-minute warning. In other words, not enough time to really do much, but too much to do nothing at all. And that's got these weasels spooked. I don't know that we've ever really come up short like this before. It's a sticky wicket. Yes, it is, and that's why we're breezing by the big bug holding ape on Highway 7, the one they call Queen Connie for reasons we can't quite fathom and turning back to seek our salvation through syrup. Hey, we've seen museums for mustard and earthquakes, barbed wire and lighters. Why not maple? Oh, there's a charge. Uh -oh. Hello, uh -oh. is that thing running? <laughs> it is running. <laughs> Turn it off. Curator says, no camcorders, please. We the can't believe that there is a museum of maple. Yeah. Maple sugaring, yeah. Oh, maple sugaring. Wonder, maple sugaring. History of the maple sugaring process, making the maple sugar. Very interesting. This is the medium amber that they're talking about. Oh, man. Oh, a delicate maple flavor, probably best used on desserts. I'm kind of waffling on that issue. I'm not taking the tour, but is, is it really the most misunderstood agricultural commodity of Vermont? Absolutely. What's the second have most? Misunderstood? Any idea. Wow, Leo, that's it, that's, that's, the, that's, one. that's the one. I'd like to thank the Academy 
would we enjoy that syrup more if we knew the history of maple yeah. syrup? Yeah. <laughs> Missing out, not taking the tour. <laughs> Mary said it's a labor of love to make these things. Well, you know. Hey, my dentist said eat all that I can. Oh, yeah. So mission accomplished, I'd have to say. Two minutes down and some cavities to go. Oh, man. That's pure maple goodness. Yeah. Oh. You're just misunderstanding. <laughs> Sweetly from Vermont, this is Don the, the Camera show. Guy signing off. It. To learn more about the sights you've seen on this show and plan a road trip of your own, visit Rare Visions on the web at kcpt.org. You can also purchase DVDs, videotapes, and a companion book to this award-winning series. Call 1-800-459-9733. Look at that one. Holy smokes, look Holy at this. Smokes. That's odd. Oh, there it goes. Yes. Oh! Boy, it's a whole different set of muscles. Oh, did I hit you? No. You can't take the camcorder. It's We so might steal the slideshow. It did start our own maple syrup industry back there in the Midwest. <laughs> back in Kansas City.